Today is May the 17th, 2019. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University and I'm in New Braunfels, Texas today to interview Ruth Strawn Spivey, did I say that correctly? Who is the first electrical engineer graduate of Oklahoma A&M. First woman. First woman, yes. We've got to make sure we get that in there. First woman electrical engineer graduate, graduated in 1945. So thank you for letting me come today. I am looking forward to this. Well, let's begin with learning when and where were you born? I was born in Ripley, Oklahoma, which was which is a, almost a ghost town now on the Cimarron River between Stillwater and Cushing in, on the, June the 27th, 1924. Okay, so you're, 90, you're pushing 95. I'll be 95 in June, yes. And how did your family come to be in Ripley? Uh, my father's uh, mother and father, and also my my father's grandfather, uh, made made the run. They called it the Second Fox Run, and they uh, they all lined up. And I have I have handwritten memor memoirs that my grandma wrote about how about standing there waiting for the gun to go off. And then everybody took off and forded the river and went up the bluff. And uh, Grandpa's horse stepped in a hole and tripped. Grandpa staked his clay <laughs> about a mile up the Cimarron River. And, and, and did, were they farmers or what had brought them there? Uh, well, most everybody was a farmer. I mean, a lot of people were farmers right. back then. You know, yeah, they, they got a... They he, they had to go over to Guthrie and file, you know, and and, and they they got a quarter section. Oh, okay. About a quarter section. And where did you go to school? Ele elementary school. I started elementary school in Ripley, but in the in the uh, in G January of my uh, first grade year, we moved to Stillwater. So I basically had my my elementary education in Stillwater. Well, in Ripley, was it a one-room schoolhouse? No, it was a big, it was a big two-story schoolhouse. Mm. Uh, all twelve grades went to school in the same schoolhouse. Okay, okay. And then, and go ahead. And I can remember the day school started. We had been down to the school already and found my room and everything, you know. And my mother was going to walk me in, and I said. Mother, I can do this myself. <laughs> but I got inside and everybody was going upstairs and so I started up and that's where the high school was. So one of the one of the students took me and said, I little girl, I think you need to be going this other one. But I and I didn't tell my mother that for years. <laughs> Were you an only child? I was well, basically yes. I uh I had a little sister who was born when I was uh, in second grade, but she, and, but she had some kind of a congenital blood problem and only lived to be about nine years old. Mm. She was, sometimes she was fine, other times she was very sick. Mm. So basically, yes, I grew, I, was, I grew up an only child. And then what took them from Ripley to Stillwater? Why did your parents move to Stillwater? Uh, my father was in the was a cashier in the bank in Ripley, mm. and back when they had the bank crash, you know, and the bank closed, and the county treasurer in Stillwater, whom my father did business with, had been wanting him to come work for him anyway, and mm. my dad had not really been wanting to move, so he'd sort of turned him down. So the day the the bank closed wasn't open, my dad started to still water on this dirt road and cut through, started to still water to see if the a position in the treasurer's office was still open. And he sees a car coming and it's the county treasurer coming to see if he if he's changed his mind. So he worked in the county treasurer's office. In fact he he was he ultimately got elected county treasurer and what, I think, mm. 18 times he got reelected or something. Oh. He finally had to beg his deputy to run so he could retire. <laughs> well, where did you live in Stillwater? 
On North Duncan Street, okay. 221 North Duncan. Okay. Well, I, when, the first, when we first moved there, we lived on Lewis Street, and then uh, my mom and dad bought lots and built a house. That's not too far from campus. Well, it's close, yeah. So for first grade on through 12th was all in Stillwater? Yes, ma'am. What was the high school? That was... Well, the, the high school was... Donard wasn't built yet. It was the old, the old high school. Before that, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What was your favorite subject in high school? Math and, math and physics. Okay. How big was your class? Oh, I don't remember. 50, 60 kids. Oh, kind of small. Somewhere, somewhere between, somewhere 50 plus or minus. I don't remember exactly. But, uh, did you have a hobby? Uh, reading. Reading. I was an avid reader. But, uh, so where was the public library then? On 6th Street. You know where the old courthouse is? The public library was right there on the corner, right across. Okay, right across. Okay, it says public library. Across. I wondered. Yeah, that's okay. where. Well, that was new. That was the new library. Well, you. By the there. time I started checking out books, that was where the library was. But it was brand new. Okay. And what would you do for fun? Oh, for fun. I like I like to play games, and I like to. Uh, Oh, we had we had a we had quite a large lot. We had a croquet, and my my my, pat, my father and I loved to play croquet. And my grandmother, she when she came, she loved to play croquet too. And Chinese checkers and dominoes and that kind of thing. Well, did they have their own chickens and no, 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 no. Since in the city? My my grand my grandparents did, but. Uh, and I had an aunt and uncle. By the time I was a child, I aunt and uncle lived on the homestead where grandma and grandpa had moved into Ripley. Okay. And uh, so yeah, we had, ch they, during the war, they always had chickens and butter and you know the kinds of things that were hard to buy. <laughs> so in high school, what were you planning to be? Did you think, were you thinking about a career at that point? Uh, I hadn't, well, I thought I wanted to be an interior decorator. And, because uh, I love to go into furniture stores and look at the furniture. <laughs> and, uh, my, uh, in my, in my, uh, having a senior moment. <laughs> in my junior year in high school, no, no, in, in grade, my first science course was when I was in eighth grade. And the guys were talking about exceeding the speed of sound. And I don't remember the teacher's name, wouldn't mention it if I did, but he stood up in front of that class and he said, if anything ever exceeds the speed of sound, it will disintegrate. Eighth, now this was this was back out of my eighth grade science class. Uh, so how the world has changed. That's right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I uh, my other my other grandparents lived in Iowa, and we always went to Iowa every year to visit them. And my dad had two brothers who lived in Kansas City. So we'd spend a weekend in Kansas City going up and a weekend in Kansas City coming back. And another thing I loved was airplanes. Hmm. And you know, back before World War II started, flying was part of the, it was an elective of the Oklahoma A&M curriculum. And I was going to do that. Of course, by the time I got into A and M, the war had started, and they weren't doing it anymore. <laughs> so I didn't get to do it. But my first plane ride was still, of course, Stillwater didn't have an airport. Right. But out north of Stillwater, there was a guy who would mow his meadow, and people could bring their planes. 
And one time, and I was about 10 or 12 years old, this guy came with a Ford Trimoto, and he was offering rides, and my dad took me out. Took me out and we got to go up in a Ford Trimotor, and that was my first airplane ride, and I loved it. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, I was just kind of a crazy kid. You know, when I was little, we'd pass a construction site and there'd be a steam shovel working. I always had to stop and watch. You know, that sort of thing fascinated me. And did your dad know enough to explain what it, you know, what it was going on or no, at work? Not, not really. My, my dad, my dad worked in the bank. <laughs> did numbers, yes. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we moved to Stillwater in the in the middle of my first grade year. That'd be about nineteen thirty-ish. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. Around the 1930s. Yeah. And uh, we lived on Lewis Street for a while, and then we, my mom and dad built their place on North Duncan. So, uh, dur and of course, during the war, you know, all the dorms were filled with the military. And the, waves. You know, the waves and the, and the F ASTPs and all the Army, the Army and Navy people. So did you live at home? Yeah, I just lived, well, you know, it, it made sense. I was within easy walking distance yes. of school. <laughs> it was just easy to live at home. Do you remember where you were when the Pearl Harbor announcement came on? This is funny. I was, that day, that Sunday, I had been writing a letter to my cousin who lived in Arkansas. And I had been telling, and I mentioned in the letter what a boring day it was. And put the letter in the mail, and then later on that day, we heard that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So he always teased me about that, <laughs> about Pearl Harbor being such a boring day. But yeah, I can I can remember very very plainly. So you graduated from high school in high school 1942. in 1942. Yeah, from high school in 42. Yeah. Okay, so you would have been a a senior that yeah, senior when right. that was going on. Okay. So in 1938-ish, they built a field house. Yes. Do you have any stories about? about oh, well, that? that was that was within six or seven blocks of where where I, where I was living. Yeah. But the but and then my dad started taking me to basketball games. Cool. Because. One of the ladies who worked for my dad in the county treasurer's office, her, his, their son was on the basketball team and they had season tickets. And any time they couldn't use their season tickets, they gave them to my dad. And my mother could care less about basketball, so he'd take me. So I became a oh, Oklahoma and then basketball fan when I was junior high age. I was an avid a and basketball. So you got to watch Coach Ida? Yes, ma'am, I sure did. And I uh, I remember, uh, I, I can remember so dis vividly when Bob Curlin, who was uh, the first seven-footer ever, I guess, to play basketball anywhere, and uh, he was he was tall and he had real long arms, but he was so... And but it, and his feet his feet were huge, and they didn't have the kind of basketball shoes they have now, you know. And, he, and when he would run down the floor, you'd wonder if he was going to make it to the other end before he fell over his feet. But he could actually, if a, the opponent was sh shot a basket, his he could shoot that long arm up through the basket, and uh, deflect the ball before it hit the rim. And there was no law, no rule against it. Goaltending wasn't a... Because nobody had ever done it before. You know, what, what do you need a rule against something nobody's done? So there was no rule against it. And the other thing, there wasn't any shot clock. And so Hank Iba would get a little, our team would get a little bit ahead. Sometimes he'd let his players go out and sit on the floor and one guy would be sitting on the ball and the opponent team would 
be trying to get the ball away. <laughs> and Fog Allen was there, was that they were arch rivals, and Fog Allen used to get so mad. And I remember one time he he got so mad he picked up a metal folding chair and threw it down the sideline. You know, and of course he got ejected. But uh, those were the days. You know the rules of best. You know you know shot clock. So you, the basketball was a completely different sport. Was the stands usually full? Uh, well, the field, had, you know, they had gone from from such a small arena to the field house. The, at, to start with, the field house would usually not be, but but as, because we had such good basketball teams, the year I graduated, you know, we won the NCAA tournament and. And uh, and the field house would be pretty well full, but when we had those real good basketball teams, and also we had real good football teams, and uh, Bob Fenmore, you know, we won you know, my junior year. He took us to the Cotton Bowl, and senior year he took us to the Sugar Bowl. And I guess you're aware that that. Uh, on the Oklahoma, the new Oklahoma A&M Stadium, they have that that says National Champions in 1945, and that was because it didn't. They were they didn't have national champions in 1945, but the uh, the N the NCAA people gave the college colleges an opportunity to nominate their team for a national champion. And my understanding is Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State was the only one who ever did it. Hmm. But they put in. They did the paperwork and nominated their team and got and got honored as the national national champion. Did you Did you attend football as much as you did basketball? Uh, not a well, not when I was. I started going to the basketball games when I was ten or twelve years old. Uh, the football, I didn't really start attending till I was in college. Okay. Very much. Okay. But yeah, when I was in college, I, I, I liked football too. Well, when you were deciding, once you enrolled to Oklahoma A&M, did you declare a major that early? Uh, yes, I did. Actually, in my senior year in high school, and, one, and I, my favorite subjects in school were math and science. In my uh, in my uh, senior year in high school, I was in the, we were, I was taking physics, which I really liked, really enjoyed, and uh, I was uh, anyway. We were, I was taking physics, and they announced one day that there were going to be some people coming from the college to talk about careers in engineering. So I told my lab partner, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to that. He said, why? He said, you're not gonna do that, you're just gonna get married. Well, you know, he didn't stop to think, maybe you could do both. <laughs> but I went, and they were talking about the, this was during, the, of course, World War II had started. <laughs> there was a lot of, uh, it, this really sparked the interest in technology. And uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, I went and I thought, that's what I'm going to do. So I got, came home and I told my folks. And my mother says, now I says, she says, I think you ought to do chemical engineering or something like that where you can work in a lab instead of civil engineering where you have to go out in the field. You know, she didn't want me out on the dam side or something, <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Anyway, so I signed, I, I initially registered in chemical engineering, but unfortunately I had a qualitative analysis lab, and I was going, of course, during the war you went, you were going three semesters round the clock, you know, you didn't have a summer break. So it was summer and I was taking qualitative analysis and we were had participating in 
trying to participate out things using a hydrogen sulfide, which made me sick. So every time I'd come home from from chemistry lab, I'd be sick. So I got to thinking maybe engineering's not for me after all. But I was dating a guy I had met in a math class, and he was taking electrical engineering with electronics option, and he was really enjoying that. And I got to thinking, well, you know, he and I can have classes together if I'd change my major. And besides that, it would, maybe that one wouldn't make me sick. So I changed to electrical in my sophomore year. Huh. Were there other women in, in, those, in those classes? There were women, there were about eight or ten women who were, who were going to taking engineering at the same time I was. In fact, back in, back in March of 1944, we, there was an article published in Oklahoma State Engineer about us women who were in engineering. And there were three of us who were, there was a couple who were seniors and three of us who were juniors and the rest of them were freshmen. But uh, anyway, there, there was, but interestingly enough, there were very few in the class. You know, in, in 1945, the year I graduated, I was the first woman electrical engineer to graduate. But there were only a total of 11 engineering graduates in all the engineering disciplines. Wow. Because all the guys had been drafted and, and it worked out very well for me because I got a lot of personal attention I probably wouldn't have gotten if the class had been large. And Not necessarily because you were a female, but because you were one of a few students. But because there were so few students, okay. you know, we were. So when we had the labs and everything, you know, we got a lot more attention from the professor than we would have if we had like had a class of fifty. You know. Or were, did you find them easy? The classes easy, or did you struggle with some of them? You know, the class I struggled with the most was was uh, freshman. PE. I couldn't do push-ups. <laughs> the suit the teacher. Anyway, no, I, I didn't. I, I didn't have much trouble. I did flunk one class, and that was economics. And the reason I flunked it was because I was taking a, a heavy course load, and I was and and I was concentrating on my engineering subjects and the and you had to read the chapter in the in the economics book because he gave a pop quiz at the beginning of the class and i i there was too many times i didn't get around to reading it but the second time i got me <laughs> that economics would play well with your father in who was in <laughs> dealing with money <laughs> yeah <laughs> how did you tell him you funked that class <laughs> He did. I I had very laid back parents. You know, they a lot of the people who live here talk about uh, their strict parents, and if they weren't there at dinner at six o'clock, they didn't get to eat. My parents were really laid back, and and my husband and I were laid back parents too. So our kids, they more I, they more grew up than they did get raised. You know? <laughs> So uh, you mentioned trimesters, so that you you finished quickly then. If you well, if yeah, you, that's how come I graduated from high school in forty two and I graduated from college in forty five. I was wondering. But the reason that. was because we were we were on that trimester system, and so they and they had done that because of the of the they, war. They did that because of the war. Yeah, mm, I didn't know that. I I don't know. I don't know all the particulars, but that's just the way it worked during the war. Okay. Well, you graduated in 45. Right before we get there, I was reading that you helped start a, a, a society for... Well, we, they called it, yeah. The, the men had Sigma Tau, which was the engineering fraternity, you know. And uh, it was kind of a men-only thing. 
So we women started what we call Sigma Delta. In in the in the write up in in the state magazine, they showed a picture I didn't even have. I don't know where he found it of the Sigma Delta ladies. But anyway, that was a fun time. Sounds like it was a fun time. Yeah, and it you have no idea. When you're that age, you have no idea what's ahead of you. Hmm. And if I, I had a career that I couldn't have even imagined about, it was, I had such a good, such a great career. But uh, did you have a mentor along the way? Well, I'm assuming there wasn't any female faculty members. No, no, I didn't have any female faculty members. But uh, I, Professor Nader, he's the one who told me I should do a summer, a summer uh, job between my junior and senior year. I, I took, I, I skipped a, sem a semester and went to uh, work, got a job with GE in Fort Wayne, Indiana at their works lab, mm. at, the, at their Fort Wayne, Indiana plant, which, Gave me a actual hands-on feel for what engineers did, mm -hmm. and that that was that was very beneficial. And then I had this professor in. I in my senior year, I was taking a steam power plant course from Dr. Baker, who was head of the mechanical engineering department. And he came to me one day and he said. Ruth, you know you're invading a man's world. Adapt. Don't try to change it. And uh, that's some of the best advice I ever got in my life. <laughs> not, not just from that standpoint, but adapting in general. <laughs> because uh, I, after I married an engineer that I met, well, then let me go back to my first job. So I graduated in 1945 from with my electrical engineering degree, and I put out job applications, and I got three offers. And I took GEs in Schenectady, New York, because that was the highest at a dollar an hour. A dollar an hour, can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, so I went, so I left home and went to Schenectady, New York. Well, that's a long way from Stillwater. Yep, I'd never, I'd never been East of the Mississippi before. <laughs> How did you get there? On the train. On the train. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I took took the train and by yourself, or did your parents go with you? Oh, I went by myself. Actually, I spent the. There was some ex neighbors of ours who had he had been associated with the university and was had gone to D.C. during the war. They invited me to spend a week in D.C. with them and see the sights there on my way. So I did that. And uh, then I uh, went on up to Schenectady and went to, and my mother says, now go to the YMCA and they'll put you up, for, or YWCA. And they'll put you up for the night and they will have a list of rental, rentals, you know, which I did and, they, and she was right, they did. So I had a, I had a, uh, very nice little uh, basement sort of apartment. It didn't have a kitchen, so it wasn't really an apartment. But and uh, that's where I lived when I was working for for GE. And it was just across. It was in a little town called Scotia, which was just across the Mo Mohawk River from Schenectady. It was there. They had the. They ran the uh, buses. Every morning, you know, and every evening, they they run the express buses straight to GE. And pretty safe for a female to be living then. Sounds like. Well, I didn't have any. I, I didn't have sense to know if it wasn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your title? Well, I started off on what they called the test engineer program. I was a test engineer. 
actually got engineer in the title. Right, yeah, I was a test engineer, and, and gee, there actually were about a half a dozen of other women in the test engineer program, and one of the personnel people would get us together once in a while, but it was mostly men. And Schenectady was a real old plant, and the, most of the buildings were very old, and you know, everybody heated with coal, and it was really dirty. And uh, because I, because there were so few of us women, you know, in the program, I didn't. There was no ever a problem with getting dates, you know. Yeah. But uh, so I, I would, I had usually have dates with three or four people over a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then one day, I came to work. This was after I'd been there about a year, and on these, uh, the way the test engineer program worked, you were on either a three-month or a six-month assignment, and then you rotated to a different, different factory, so that you got a feel for the first. The first job I had, I was in uh, industrial co controls, mm. you know, steel mill controls and stuff like that. I did that for three months and tested these big panels, you know, the control panels and everything. And then I would, uh, the second assignment I had, we were testing big induction motors. And that was really a dirty place. And so one day, one Monday I come to work and I see a new, a new guy and he is a real you know, he's tall and rangy and auburn, Sun Street auburn hair, and he, his face was so brown, his eyebrows were lighter than his face. And I was thinking, gee, I'd like to get acquainted with him. Well, about the third day there, I looked up from where I was working, and there he was standing right beside me, and he took out his hand, and he says, I'm Frank Spivey from... Dallas, Texas, and I'd like to take you to dinner tonight. And I say, well, you know, I need to go home and clean up first. And he says, ah, he says, you wash your face and hands, and I wash your face and come here and we'll go somewhere dark. And so we went to this little cafe and set off into a dark corner <laughs> and got acquainted. And he was from Dallas, Texas, and had gone to Texas a and m And <clears throat> It was, uh, and he had the most beautiful blue eyes. And it was kind of one of those love at first sight things. You know, all the other guys I had dated were nice guys, and I enjoyed their company, but I was in love with this guy. <laughs> and uh, so ultimately we got married. Not, actually that, I met him in, in the spring. Uh, yeah. 46? Uh, uh, that would be 46, yeah. I met him in the spring, about February, March, about March. And we got married in December. <laughs> so, That's pretty quick, yes. Yeah. Had he been in the service? Yes, he had. He, he had actually graduated from Texas A&M in 43 and had gone right into the service and had been uh, uh, over in the South Pacific manning a... Uh, uh, radar site for a B-25 squadron and uh, during it, be, and you know we were getting ready before they dropped the bombs we were getting ready to invade mm -hmm. Japan and uh, he was his, his group was sitting on an LST off the coast of the Philippines waiting to invade Japan when they dropped the bombs and then they became the Army of Occupation. Mm -hmm. And because he was interested in, he was an electrical engineer too, he had been interested in radio and when he was a kid and had gotten his amateur radio license when he was in high school. So they had, by that time they had assigned him to the Armed Forces Radio Service and he was operating the transmitter in the Radio Tokyo building when General MacArthur yeah. gave his first speech to his troops. 
after we yeah. invaded Japan. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in, he wasn't intimidated by a female electrical engineer. No, it seemed to be. <laughs> it didn't bother him. How, how, how did he pop the question? Uh, or did you? He did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, <laughs> this is crazy. It wasn't very long after we had been dating. We well after. After our first date or two, I, I told everybody else I was going steady. <laughs> so we'd been we'd been going up, and he he did very interesting things. Like he loved he had a bicycle and he'd rent me a bicycle, and in the weekend we'd go out bike riding around the countryside. And uh, one time we we took the paddle wheel steamer down the Hudson River, you know. And I was, I was thinking, oh boy, we'll get to sit out on the deck and neck. And he wanted to go down the engine room and watch the pistons work. <laughs> anyway, but he was, he was a really neat guy. He was, he was an only. He and I were both pretty much spoiled only children. But we, uh, it clicked. We clicked. Well, when the men started coming back from war, did some of the women get pushed out of their jobs no. or chose no, to leave? We did not. Didn't. Well, not. But see, we weren't at this point. We weren't high enough up. Well, that, you know, we were still in the test engineer phase there. You know, so no, they they did not. But they did have all these rules about. A husband and wife couldn't work in the same building, you know, you couldn't work in the same plant, or, you know. They were, there was all this concern about husbands and wives working together. Well, then how did that work out for you two once you got married, since you were in the same building? Well, we weren't, we never got to be in the same building. Okay. G had a big enough plant. Both in Schenectady and Syracuse, where they, you know, that was that was not really a okay. problem. But but I but you know, remember I told you what my mechanical engineer professor said about adapting. Well, at, uh, right after the war, GE built what they called their new electronics park, and it was in Syracuse, which was couple hours up the way from Schenectady. And uh, so when I got, and remember we were on rotating assignments, so when I got my rotating, my next rotating assignment, I got assigned to Syracuse. And Frank was still in Schenectady. So uh, I was working, I was working on uh, a shipboard radar, TDZ shipboard radar equipment, and I'm testing it, you know, coming off the assembly line. And because, and I'd go down to Schenectady, I'd, because Frank was on evening shift at the time, I'd, I'd take the train down to Schenectady and be there by the time he got off work on Friday night. And we'd spend the weekend together in Schenectady, and then I'd come back to Syracuse on Sunday night and go to work. So, uh, anyway, I was working for the, we were working, and there, this was a real hot production item, and we, they, we were doing, they were doing a lot of overtime. And I was, I was working away and on, and I, I, I loved what I was doing, and I understood it, and, and uh, I guess I was good at it. Because he kept giving me, over, letting me sign up for more overtime because I wanted to buy some new clothes for my honeymoon, you know. Because by that time, Frank had proposed. Well, anyway, uh, so one day my boss came to me and he said, we're in trouble. And I says, why? And he said, because I've been letting you work more overtime than the law allows women to work. He said, I come forgot you were a woman. And you know, a lot of women would have been insulted. I thought, gee, I did a good job of adapting. <laughs> you know, it, it was, which, yeah, that's, that's neat, yes.
Huh? That's cool, yeah. I thought, I thought it was real cool. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we didn't get in big trouble. He just, I just, he had just had to not let me work as much overtime as he'd been letting me. But but, uh, but, but men can work overtime as much as they want. But yeah, not, right. but women could. There was a rule of, we had to protect our delicate women, you know. We couldn't, they couldn't make it. They couldn't make us work overtime. And they weren't making me, you know, you always had the option of refusing. Anyway, Frank and I got married on December, th um, Friday, December the 13th, 1946, <laughs> in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and uh, went to Dallas on our honeymoon, and I met all his friends and you know, his, his parents. Oh, and his stepbrother who was going to SMU was supposed to be our, his best man and was supposed to come to Stillwater. And after we got to Stillwater, we were getting ready for the rehearsal and everything, he found out that his stepbrother couldn't come. So Frank was without a best man. So I had an old friend from when I was in college named Lloyd Redmond who was still living in Stillwater and my mother's sister. I'll bet Lloyd Redmond would be his best man, and he just got a new suit. And it turned out Lloyd's suit matched Frank's suit. And so Frank got married with the best man he didn't even know. <laughs> and he met a, you know, Frank, he met him, got acquainted with him before, before the wedding. But. So, oh, so we adapted. You know, we did. We weren't going to let it spoil our wedding and our plans for our honeymoon in Dallas. We adapted. <laughs> Frank had, a, Frank had one of my old boyfriends for his best bet. <laughs> so that word adapt is really, you know, we, we did a lot of it through our whole life and uh, it worked. Well, how long did you both work at GE? Uh, Frank worked at GE for years. I'll, 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 I'll get okay. to Okay, okay. But not, not in Syracuse and Schenectady. Shortly after we were married, <clears throat> we were living in, uh, by that time Frank had transferred to Syracuse, we were living in Syracuse, New York, and um, Frank got an opportunity to join GE's field engineering uh, division and go out to Maryland Shipyard as a field engineer on shipboard radar equipment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in 1940, well, in the, in the meantime, we, we had had a, we'd had a daughter. Our first, our first daughter was born in May of 1948, and uh, she, Frank, so I had, I had quit. There was a rule against women working if you were pregnant. You couldn't show. You know, I got, I got away with it for two or three months, and then I had to quit. And uh, so anyway, I was not working, and uh, Frank got this opportunity to move to Vallejo, California. And so we did, and uh, I uh, had one of the most interesting plane rides I have ever had in my life on the way out there. Do you want me to talk about it? Sure. Okay, Frank drove, We at, in the meantime, you know, at, during World War II, they didn't make cars. So unless you were on some dealer's list, you couldn't get a new car. So one day, uh, shortly after Pat was born, Frank called me at work and said, called me from work and said one of his co-workers had just gotten a car, found out he was had, had come up on the dealer's list for a car, and he had a 1930 Model A Ford he wanted to sell for $100, and what did I think? And I says, buy it! So we had a car. Our first car was a 1930 Model A Ford. And, uh, but we were, we were among the first of the couples we knocked around with, we were, there was two, two or three of us who had cars, nobody else did. We'd pick up 
pick up our friends who didn't have and we'd all go to the lake on the weekend and stuff like that. But, but uh, anyway, <coughs> so Frank drove the car and but we decided that was probably too much of a trip to try with a year old baby. So why didn't I fly? Because GE was paying for it anyway. So I flew out. And having grown up in Oklahoma, I had never been west of Oklahoma. I had been east of Oklahoma, but never west. So uh, I, I, I got the first leg of my flight was from Syracuse to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and my parents met me, and I spent Pat's first birthday with my parents. And then we, they took me back to Tulsa to catch the flight to California. And it was, and for some reason they, then they scheduled the flights at crazy hours in the morning. Like this flight was like at four or five o'clock in the morning. And it was pouring rain. And they didn't have jetways, you know. You had to walk out across the tarmac and come up the steps to board your plane. All the air, all the airline personnel were holding umbrellas over people, you know, to get it, get the plane boarded. And we took off, and we'd been, and of course, like I say, it was still in the dark. So Pat and I both went back to sleep. I went to sleep. And about sunlight, sunrise, the pilot came on the PA and said, uh, I'm, he said, we're approaching the Grand Canyon and I'm going to take you down and show you sunrise over the Grand Canyon. And we went so low, you could see the rims of the canyon off the wingtips. We were that low. Of course, that was, this was back in 19... 49, you know, and they didn't have rules against that kind of stuff. And it was, it was a, uh, some kind of a recon, reconditioned air, air, uh, air Force transport plane that they had made, that they were, had sold to the airlines. Anyway, so we went down and here we saw this beautiful, I'd never seen the Grand Canyon, that was the most fantastic sight, all the red rock and the sun and the, and the sunrise. And then they fed us breakfast and we were approaching this big high, I could see it ahead, this big high snow-covered mountain. And I was thinking, if we don't get a little bit higher, he's going to hit that thing. <laughs> And so anyway, we, we flew over Mount Whitney, you know, the mount, right over the top of Mount Whitney, so close you could see the faces of the people on the ground who were waving at us. And then the pilot said, now he says, uh, if nobody objects, I can take you through Kings Canyon. He said, uh, and he says, I'm, I, was a, I was a fighter pilot during the war, and he says, I've done this before. I'll show you King's Canyon. We threw, flew through the canyon with fur-covered mountains, evergreen-covered mountains on both sides. Wow, came that's out, amazing, yes. Came out of it. I don't know if anybody... I, when I tell people that, they don't believe me. But anyway, we did. And then we came, you know, about an hour later, we came in over to San Francisco Bay and landed in San Francisco, and there was Frank waiting to meet us. And the first thing he did was take me to breakfast at the beach, and we could sit there and eat our pancakes and look at the Golden Gate Bridge. And I, you know, it was one of the best days of my life. A, long, a little girl from Stillwater, Oklahoma, <laughs> yes. Anyway, that was, that was, that was, that was just a side note, but it was uh, it, it was a uh, yeah, real experience. And when I tell people about it, they say they they didn't really do that. But but you know, back in those days, they let people come down. Over, they let commercial planes come down over the Grand Canyon until two collided, 
uh, two, two or three years later, and then they wouldn't let them do it anymore. Of course, nowadays you wouldn't think of doing anything. <laughs> A commercial airline doing anything like that, but they did back then. But anyway, so we got out to Vallejo, and we were living in uh, government housing, which was. Uh, Vallejo was a big shipyard, and during the war they had built government housing outside the base, and so we had a nice, a real nice little duplex in government housing, and we lived there. And then we had been living there about a year. That wasn't quite two yet. When Frank called me one day, and he says. I'm coming home for lunch and pick you up, get dressed for a job interview because there's a, a gentleman out here who wants to talk to you. That's how my husband supported my career. <laughs> no, it wasn't me wanting to work at him. Oh, you got to stay home and take care of the kids. It was he came to me with this guy wants to talk to you. Opportunity knocks. Right, so I he so I got spruced up and took my daughter down to the neighbor and we took we went over to Maryland Shipyard and I got, I got interviewed by a guy named Vern Seeley who was in the who was head of the shipboard radar division and they hired me. So uh, at how much an hour? I don't, I honestly don't remember. More, I don't more remember. than a dollar. Though. It was more than a dollar. Okay. Might even have been two or three. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I got, uh, so I started doing that. And then the I had the opportunity to work on, well, you know, are, are you familiar with Ivy Mike? Mm -mm. You remember back, well, you probably weren't even born, uh, when they did the, that, what they called the H-bomb test at Enna mm, A little bit. Well, that was called Ivy Mike. And after I had been working at the shipyard for a few months, the USS Estes, which was going to be the command ship for the Ivy Mike H-bomb test, uh, came in to for to get outfitted for the for the test, and I Frank and I were both working on it. He was assigned to the on G closed circuit TV. He was working on it, and I was working on getting this microwave system set up to send the signal to detonate the thing. And so I I can remember crawling around on this radar shipboard radar pedestal, trying to figure out how we could adapt this pedestal to to mount the, this uh, antenna for the microwave. And so Frank and I both both got to work for, on Ivy, Ivy Mike. And of course, we had to have security clearances and everything to do that. So I got my security clearance. Were there other women at that job? No. Did In fact, there was a big, I, I had, I was the, well, there was, okay, there was one other woman, but she was working in it. She worked in the same vicinity, but not on a different job. She wasn't working on Ivy Mike. But uh, anyway, so that was my first experience with uh, a government, you know, real government job. Frank actually got to ride the ship all the way to Pearl Harbor. Because they were still having problems with the closed circuit TV, but I didn't get to do that. But there was a discussion about whether I they had been letting me go down on ships that were on in dry dock, but now this ship was the the crew was still living on board, and there was a discussion about can we let a woman go down on the ship with the crew still living on board. And I said, well, you know, I said, all the crew quarters are below decks. And I said, the only thing I'm, place I'm going to be is above deck. What difference does it make? <laughs> so they finally let me. But uh, 
What would you wear? Oh, I have slacks and... Slacks? Most, like, my, back when the man told me, I, he almost forgot I was a woman. I was wearing slacks and a, and a flannel shirt or something, you know. And a hard hat. You always wore your hard hat. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so how long were you at that job? Oh, let me think. Mare Island Shipyard. Until you had a second baby, maybe? No, well, not yet. Um. Oh, well, Frank, what happened was G was getting into television, big time, television transmitters and antennas, <laughs> and Frank that wanted he he was he was intrigued, so he actually requested to get to go go back to uh, Syracuse and become a part of this television group. He his his engineering was more out in the field than it was in design. Mm -hmm. He took he took the equipment, got it installed and tested and stuff. That's the part he loved, and uh, so. We went back to Syracuse, and uh, yeah, our second, our second baby, who was about five years younger than our first baby, uh, we had her, her in Syracuse also. But uh, Frank got involved with the field engineering, and, and of course I was pregnant again, so I, I didn't, I didn't try to get a job there for a couple of years. And did he find the next one for you? Did, did, I, did Frank find your next job for you? Uh, no. <laughs> I found that one for myself. So Frank got an opportunity to get back in, get into the broadcast division of GE and uh, work on TV stations. UHF TV had just come out. And so he, he was offered a job being a field engineer in uh, broadcast TV, which entailed working out and, and installing the transmitter and the microwave link and the, and the uh, antenna, working on the antenna, and he climbed those crazy towers <laughs> with test equipment on his back and loved it. So anyway, uh, we moved back to Syracuse. And I had, we had our second child, and uh, during that time in Syracuse, I did not work. And when, uh, when our second child was about a year and a half or two, uh, he, Frank got an opportunity to become the field engineer out of the San Francisco district office for GE. So we moved back out to California. And that, we lived in Belmont for a year, and then we bought a house in Los Altos. And we, we, this was back in 1954, 55, 1954, we bought a house in Los Altos. And, uh, you know, Los Altos at that point was just a little, they were building subdivisions in the fruit orchards. And Los Altos was just a little, little village. And we got our house for $20,000. Mm -hmm. Well, we lived there for eight years and sold it for 40 and thought we made a killing. And the last time it sold, it sold for 1.6 million. Wow. Because it's right in the middle of Silicon Valley. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we bought, we bought this house we just loved. 
And uh, anyway, so Frank, and after, after three or four years, I went, I went to work for a company called the Morris Guronic Associates in San Carlos. And I worked on projects for Lockheed and United Technology and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And my first actual job of supervising was when they assigned me to uh, install a, the uh, uh, automatic sequencer and the data acquisition systems for the first ro solid rocket fuel test cell at United Technology. Wow. So I got to, I, I, I had six guys working for me. You supervised the men? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And six men working for me. And that, that went very well and they were very pleased. And so that was, that, that, gave, that gave me a good feeling. But, uh, so anyway, Frank, Frank worked on the uh, TV, TV stations. And then, after about three or four months of him doing that, GE decided that they didn't want to have a field engineering office in San Francisco anymore. They just wanted one in Seattle and one in LA, and they wanted us to move to LA. Frank did not want to move to LA. <laughs> so there for a while, he quit GE, and he went to work for Hewlett Packard. And uh, at that point, Hewlett Packard was a startup. Huh? You know, they were an employee-owned company. Your pay was based on the profits for the hmm. pay period. So you never knew how much your paycheck was going to be, really. But they were things were going well, and and he and he enjoyed. working with test equipment and stuff. So he was all excited about that. Until the the HP came out with this new 150 oscilloscope. It was a big, great big kludge of an oscilloscope. And it was their they're gonna be their showpiece for the West Cup. And uh, so Frank told Dave Packard, he said, there's, it's not, there's something, it's not right, it's got a problem. But David already advertised it for the Westcon, so he did, they went ahead and did it, and they sold a bunch of them, and then they had to recall them all. Mm -hmm. And one week, and then because our, our, uh, Frank's salary, their salary was based on the profits, all of a sudden, one week, we couldn't live on our pay. <laughs> we couldn't make our house payment, our car payments. So anyway, Frank, had, Frank yeah, he was about to have an anxiety, he was having an anxiety attack. And uh, so I, I said, everybody in the Bay Area is hired. Go get a job with somebody else. So he got a job with a company called Lincourt that made the Toronto coils back when they used, did Toronto calls for memory, for computers. He so he went to work for Lankard. And by and uh, when I was, I, we had decided to try one more time for a son, so I was pregnant again, and it, I couldn't go to work. <laughs> so anyway, it all worked out because, uh, and then when Hal was just a little, but, but still a baby. Lentgert hired me to, do, to do, actually do the logic diagrams for the relay. We did this was when you did it with relays and with open and closed con contacts and stuff. And I knew how to do that. And Frank didn't. He 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 wasn't into drawing, and I was a good dra good drawer. So they hired me as a contractor to do the logic diagrams, and I did them in my house. I had a big drafty redrawing book, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we did that, and then 
So Frank was working for Lenter, and then he went to work for Varian for a while. And then GE contacted him and wanted him to come back. This was after we lived in California, eight or ten years. GE wanted him to come back and go to Tucson and and be on the crew for the... Uh, they, remember back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, during the Cold War, they were building those missile complexes around all the bases. Mm -hmm. well, anyway, Davis Mountain was getting this Titan, these Titan missile sites, and they wanted Frank to come back and work for them and take care of the microwave communications. So he did, and and uh, so I quit Morris Garonic, which I, you know, I, I loved working for him, but, you know, we were going to move, so we moved to Tucson. And uh, lived in Tucson, and we were on per diem, and I wasn't, wasn't particularly interested. So I wasn't, hadn't really thought about going back to work, until one day, my da oldest daughter, who was then in high school, comes home and says, uh, she had a fellow, said, a uh, friend named Drusilla Sternberg. And she says, Drusilla's dad wants to talk to you about going to work for him. <laughs> okay, so I go talk to Mr. Sternberg, and he wants, he, he and I, I, one thing I was very good at, most engineers, didn't like, I love to do ink, ink on mylar drawings, mm -hmm. which, you know, is why we did a lot of the plans for ink on mylar. And she said, and Mr. Sternberg needed somebody to do the location maps for, he worked for the Arizona Highway Department. He needed somebody to do the location maps for the uh, I-10 bypass around Benson, California. Benson, Arizona. And uh, I said, well, you know, I, I took a survey. I can read survey notes from survey books. And I, and I, I love to draw. Why? You know, it's not, in, it's not in electrical engineering, but it's engineering. Why don't I go ahead and do it? So I took the job. I did while we lived, uh, while we lived in Tucson. And then that job with the missile complex is finished up and we got transferred to Lynchburg, Virginia, which is where their microwave plant was. So where was it? The, the company had closed where Frank was. And you were, you were in West Virginia, microwave. No, no, we were moving to my, we were moving to Virginia. Yeah. Lynchburg, Virginia, not West Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Microwaves. Okay, are, you, are we back on? Yeah. So it, we were moved. So we moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, which was a real culture shock from uh, from uh, California and Arizona because the, the, of all the civil rights the, uh, uh, demonstrations and what have you that were going on. And uh, anyway, so. Frank gets settled in in his job, and we find a place to live we really like, and then uh, I go out looking for a job. And I see this job, this one, one ad in the paper for a good, good Morgan Pipe and Foundry Company, and they need somebody to do manufacturing process automation. Well, I knew how to do that. I'd done it. So I call the number, and this gentleman, I said I was calling regarding your ad in the paper. There was dead silence on the other end of the line. I said, sir, are you still there? And he says, well, yes, somebody said, uh, I, was expect I wasn't expecting a woman to call. And I said, well, you say you're an equal opportunity employer. So I went in, and this was a big foundry, you know, where they made steel pipe. And uh, they had their cupolas, you know, they melted their metal. And, they, and it was right down on the bank of the James River. And 
I had I, I had the quals, you know. I, I he, he knew I knew how to do what he needed done. And he said, but you know, he says, we've never allowed a woman down in our plant. This is in the manufacturing part of the plant. And I said, well, you know, I can I said, I don't know how I can do a very good job for you if I can't go down in the plant. But he said, well, let's try it for a month. He said, we can get the drafts one. I said, well, I'm, I don't think that'll work, but we can try. Because I don't have another job. So, we, uh, I took the job and I, uh, you know, I had, the manufacturing process automation was something I knew. You know, and I knew I knew, you know, it, it was, I was comfortable with it. And uh, so anyway, uh, this went on for a month and I just, but I wasn't happy because I couldn't see what I was doing. You know, I, I had an idea what I was doing, but I, I didn't feel like I had any hands on. So after about a month, I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure this is really going to work. So he disappeared, and about a few, million, few minutes later, he comes back with a hard hat and says, here, I'm taking you down into the plant. Well, I could see why, because here were these cupolas of molten metal going overhead, you know, they were pouring it into the little ladles for the machines, and they were these 20-foot-long rotating uh, casting machines, and then when the metal got to the end, it was like a giant pinwheel. It was not, it was a dangerous place. Mm. You had to watch what you were doing. But anyway, uh, so after, after that, after that one thing, and then I didn't panic and pass out, they uh, hired, they let me go down and plan anytime I wanted. Mm. So then I started coming to work dressed more in stacks and stacks and, dress and skirts and hose, but anyway. And this would be what time period? Was that when the Oh, six, then, let's see, Lynchburg, Virginia. This was in the uh, 60s by then? Yeah, in the 60s. 60s. Okay. Right in the middle of, and so we're, that was why it was such a culture shock of moving from California and Arizona to Virginia where it mattered what color the person was that sat beside you at the lunch counter? No, I didn't care. <laughs> but the people back there did. Anyway, so after I after I uh, was able to go down the plant, I, I I was able to knock out their work. And everything was clear sailing until one day. This young man, young college age man comes in and I'm introduced to him and he is the son of one of the top executives of the company called pont a mousson in France, which owned Glamorgan. And he is supposed to do this time and motion study, you know, on making cast time time. What all the, when they could when they did the steam and when they did the electricity and when they all this stuff. So, uh, and because the the Virginians didn't like the French very well either, because they 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 said, "Oh, Ruth will do it." You know, so they assigned me this young man to take around and show the showing the plan and having figure out. So he and I started talking, and I said. Do you, do, you, do you have a problem with talking to black people? And he said, well, no. <laughs> and I said, well, good. I said, because the, all, of, all the people who operate these centrifugal casting machines, you know, which are very intricate things, and I worked on a time, you know, it's a very timed operation. I said, uh, they're all black, and uh, most of the white engineers don't like to talk to them. But uh, I said, if you if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. So let's go talk to them. 
So we walked up, up, the, up the steps, going up to their position, and I'd tell them, introduce myself, introduce the kid. And they were, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were very smart. They knew that machine I go back in their hand. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, sure, we'll help you, you know. So he went, he, he had a, he did this for the summer and went back. And late after he got back home, I got a call to go down to the, up to the front office one day, and I did, and the guy said, that, you know, he said, that young man that you helped hit every operation within 10%. He said, we didn't expect him to hit it within 100. How did he do it? And I said, well, I, we entered, I introduced him to the machine operators that they helped him. And he said, you did what? Because <laughs> you know, here was me, a white woman talking. To, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was. It was one of those. It was like walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to be so careful that you didn't put make this operator look like he was being forward. You know, it, it was crazy. So anyway, so then, but at about that same time, I had gotten a job offer from the engineering, the AE firm that I had uh, interviewed with when I first went to Lynchburg, but they didn't have a vacancy then. And they wanted me to come to work for them, and I had accepted. But Morgan didn't know it yet. So anyway, I, uh, I went ahead and went and quit. I got, I got offered a, a, a job double what I was making in Glenn Morgan. Because the French people who were the men who really owned the thing, they didn't care what color the, they had. They didn't have these racial prejudices that the Virginians did, and they were tickled to death that this kid had gotten such a good, had been able to come up with such a good report. But uh, anyway, so. Uh, We did, we did, I went ahead working for them, I went to work for this AE firm. And that was a very opportune thing because they were doing, there was a, uh, one of the principals of the firm was an architect, and one of them was a mechanical engineer, and one of them was a civil engineer. And uh, they were doing uh, a lot of schools and municipal buildings and that kind of thing and they needed and uh, so they hired me to do the electrical and the alarm systems and that and then after i worked with them just a short time mr hennett who was the mechanical engineer he said you know he says i have a i a carriers is offering this school on air conditioning hvac Heating and air conditioning, and uh, I would like to send you so that you can take over some of the mechanical work because I've spent so much time out in the field. And I said okay, so I go to go to their school. I go to a train school, and then oh, and he also kept insisting I should get my PE license. Professional engineer, okay. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, gee, why not? You know, so I went to night school and took some courses and had to take the test three times to pass it. But anyway, I finally, they only offered a t test twice a year. It took me the third try to pass it, but it was partly because, partly because of the way they were messing with their testing criteria. But anyway, um, I uh, finally passed it and got my PE license. Now, I didn't have to do that. You know, I could have kept my job. I didn't have to become a, to learn how to do HVAC design. But it was, a, to me, it was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, passing my PE license, it was an opportunity. So I did it. And then, when we got transferred to uh, Texas, uh, 
GE, GE sold the, their division that Frank was working in. So we uh, got, and, and we were living in uh, Quincy, Illinois at the time. We moved from Virginia to Illinois. And G, when GE sold their uh, broadcast division, and we, uh, It was just, it, it worked out well that I had my PE license and I could do HVAC. Because when we moved to San Antonio, you know, and we got, well, Frank, Frank changed from GE to Motorola <coughs> while we lived in Illinois. And then when Motorola opened their new plant here in Sagi, Back in, back in the 70s, he was one of the first in line to put in for a transfer to Seguin because he was back in his old stomping ground. He was back home. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I went to work for a company in uh, San Antonio called Silver and Associates. And they had a uh, Silver, Silver and Associates had a, what they called an IDIQ contract with the government, and they did a lot of engineering work for Fort Sam, which is where I, where I was working. And so, uh, they, they, uh, Well, did they have very many women? Oh, so I was the only woman. Well, except his wife, who was the accountant. Well, when you got your PE, the PE license and your HVAC, were you, among other women, doing that same thing too? I was the only woman taking the test the time, the times I had to take it. Okay. And part of part of my not passing had to do with. Uh, the PE, the PE license, if you take, they were switching from the, from state generated tests to the national mm. test. And the first time, nobody, hardly anybody passed be, that I took, when I didn't pass it, hardly anybody passed because Virginia had not, they had, they were going to make you do so many problems anyway, you know, even if that's not what the national test said. So, but, so it was partly administ uh, the administration of the test was as much why I didn't pass as not knowing what I was doing. I'm assuming Frank already had his. Oh, Frank never got his. He never had He okay. never had to have it. Okay. <laughs> when you work, see, when you work for an AE firm, this was one of the best things I ever did. What does AE stand for? Architect engineer. Okay. When you work for an AE firm, you do the uh, you have to you have to be licensed to sign the drawings. See, so, so that's okay. why it's important. And G G E it didn't matter. Okay. Because so so Frank never took his. But anyway, I took it and pa finally passed it. And so anyway, I was working for Mr. Silver, and uh, then he and he gotten an, a he had gotten a, a contract to do some work in Fort Sam, and I was over at the Fort Sam Civil Engineering Office getting uh, drawings, you know, having them run drawings, and uh, the guy who was in charge of the drafting department, he was complained about how hard he had to work. And I knew, I, I worked for civil service. I knew he didn't have to work that hard. And so I was thinking, and I said, his name was Frank Canapic. I said, Frank, you've got a bird's nest on the ground. I said, I'd give my teeth to get back in civil service. And it was one of those old buildings where they had all that whole room full of cubicles, you know, and a face comes up a, uh, across the aisle, uh, over the cubicle, across the aisle, and he says, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I'm serious, who are you? And he said, well, I'm Bernie Heron, I'm chief of 
of, des of design and I need a mechanical engineer. Can you, is that what you are? And I said, yeah, I can be a mechanical engineer. And uh, so, <laughs> the next thing I knew, I got hired on the civil service. He says, he says I've got a local hire authority and if you go person to person and fill out an application, I'll hire you. He didn't even know me. He, I guess, well, he guess he knew. I, this company I worked for had a real, similar, similar associates had a real good reputation. And I guess he knew Paul Silver wouldn't hire me if I didn't know what I was doing. Anyway, so the next thing I knew, I had a, a, a GS-11 job in civil service. Pretty good paying? Huh? Pretty good paying? Not, not, not bad at all, actually. Well, by that time, Silver, they firms were paying me well, too. But anyway, so that's how I got into civil service. So I had PS11, and then when you retired, you were PS... GS. GS. GS11 to 14. GS14. Okay. Okay. So I was, I'm working at a, as a uh, engineer at, for the, uh, for Fort Sam Houston Civil Engineering Organization, which covers all that which encompasses care and construction of all the facilities on base. It's okay. not civil means it's an over overreaching thing and it covers all the facilities on base. So I am working and then the government decides this is locally in, internal to San Antonio. There were five military installations. There was Fort Sam Houston, there was Randolph Air Force Base, Lackland Air Force Base, Kelly Air Force Base, and Brooks Air Force Base. All right there together. So instead of having each organization have their own maintenance civil engineering uh, organization, they decided to combine it and call, it and call it San Antonio Real Property Maintenance Agency. Sartma, they call it Sartma for short. San Antonio Real Property Maintenance Agency. So they decided to form that. And in the meantime, uh, did I talk about EMCS before? Okay, they also, the, uh, this new, new term EMCS which stood for energy management and control systems and all of the and the gov all government organizations were getting into EMCS which was the computerized control of all of their uh, heating and air conditioning and lighting and whatever you want to control so and they were going to make this a separate department in the in their engineering structure. So I was supposed I was slated to be the EMCS engineer at Fort Sam Houston, which uh, was a which is a big post and had a lot of buildings, but they weren't really they hadn't gotten a very sophisticated EMCS. And one day I get a phone call. And the gentleman on the other end says, said, I, I'm, I'm Major Brewer from, from, from Sarma, and I want, and I want, or he said, I'm going to be the Wilford Hall uh, field engineer for Sarma, and I want you to be my EMCS engineer. I, you know, this, I did, I'd never heard of this guy. And Wilford Hall was uh, the, Air Force's premier hospital for the whole Air Force. Okay. You know, and it was new. They were did, added this wing and a new thousand bed wing, and and they were going to have a total energy plant which generated prime electric power. So the city public service was our backup instead of our prime. We were generating our prime electric power. We were. Uh, uh, 
doing the, and then also doing the chillers for the air conditioning and, you know, and, and, and we were re doing heat recovery. So we were running our generators with diesel engine and engines, and then we'd recover the heat from the engine exhaust and run chillers and our heat, heat, the, heat hot water for the heating for the whole hospital. And this was all an integrated thing. And this guy said, I am Major Ed Brewer, and I would like you to, you to come down and talk to me about being my EMCS engineer. And I said, well, sir, I've already committed to being the engine, EMCS engineer for Fort Sam. And he says, yes, but we have a state-of-the-art Johnson JC-80-55, and we've got this total energy plant, and we and this would be a lot more interesting than Fort Sammy's. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll come talk to you. So I went home that night, and I told Frank, I said, I'm going to go talk to this Ed Brewer about being the EMC engineer for Wilford Hall. And we live, the Converse is way out east of, east of San Antonio. Wilford Hall is way in the west. I'd never been to, I'd never been to Lackland Air Force Base. So Frank says, well, let's go take a drive. So we get on I-10, and it's about a 30-minute drive down. <laughs> and came to Lackland, you know, and went in, and, and here's this very impressive multi-story hospital, you know, and Frank said, and so I said, well, Frank says, you at least ought to go talk to him. See, that was the one good thing about Frank. He never was, well, I really don't want you to do that. It was always, why don't you at least give it a try? <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go talk to Ed Brewer. And part of this reorganization was that right then I was working for the Army, you know, at Fort, at Fort Sam Houston. Sodman was going to be under the Air Force. So you had to get sworn into the Air Force. And everybody was going to do it on the same day. You know, it was going to be like a mass thing. So anyway, I go down to talk to Ed Brewer, who's had an office on Fort Sam, actually. And uh, he, he tells me about all this, this wonderful opportunity. You know, we got this cogeneration and this, and this, energy recovery and, and you know we're and we're going to stay to the RDMCS and it's really going to be neat and he convinced me so I and then he says so I said okay I'll, I'll do it well he says then we then he says we got to get you sworn into the Air Force and go after Randolph and get you some tickets and I said what for he said well because I have a he was part, he had been part of the construction of Wilford Hall, and he says, I've got an uh, EMCS training session scheduled for Monday in Milwaukee, and I need to send you. <laughs> that was why he was trying just to get an EMCS engineer. Okay, <laughs> so here you, you know, you adapt. So I say, well, okay. So we get in his car, and we go roaring out all the way from Fort Sam to Randolph and get get me sworn in and, and get me a ticket and a cash advance and, and a rental car and all the stuff you do when you go to the So then I go home and Frank says, well, did you take the job? I said, yeah. And I said, uh, I've, got, I've got to leave for Milwaukee on Sunday. <laughs> he ought to be bad at that. I. You know, he, it, it was wonderful being married to him because, well, you know, he had a job where he traveled a lot. I had a job where I traveled a lot, and we just went with the flow. And uh, and the kids were older by that point. Well, yeah, oh yeah, the kids were. By the time we moved here, the only one still living. Oh, our son was. Our son even headed up. He was. He was in New Hampshire going to college and. Our one daughter was in Florida and had gotten married, and yeah, we didn't. We basically were just a single couple again. So anyway, I, <laughs> he, 
So, but, but you know, if I had had a husband who was possessive or demanding or even acted nervous when I, about my dealing with, dealing with these men all the time, I couldn't have done what I did. It took having somebody like him who actually encouraged you. Mm -hmm. It was great. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I will I take off for, I get, get my act together and get packed and get ready to go to Milwaukee and take off for two weeks in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> Were there other men up for this job, or he just knew he wanted you from the from the get go? All I can figure out is, I I did not I do not know because I didn't even know about the job when he called me and told me he wanted me to be it. So somebody knew to refer you. Well, he well if okay I had I had both the I had I had was both an electrical and a mechanical engineer because I'd taken that mechanical engineering training. Mm -hmm. And I also had my PE license. And you're probably in some kind of database. Pro well, that probably. Could, yeah, that you could look up. Yeah, and uh, so it isn't just a matter of getting a degree and then going out and getting a job and you're done. It's a matter of keeping up with your education and keeping up, keeping up with, with, with technology. And being, being re and 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 being licensed, that that that's a bigger deal than I thought it was when I took the test, <laughs> because there's a lot of supervisory jobs, like the last one I had at Kelly, that you had to be licensed to be considered for the job. <laughs> and and then you have, to, and then once you get licensed, you got to take refreshers. You know, every couple of years you got to take refresher classes through Titan or somebody. But uh, it's worth it. It's you know, it's it's an effort, but the benefits far outweigh the effort. Okay. And it, and it's and interestingly enough, on another thing, I never when they needed people to go TDY, you know, to travel. Uh, on jobs, I never, I never said no. A lot of the guys would say, "Oh, I can't do that. My wife has got such and such." Well, I had the kind of relationship I had with my husband. I could, I was free to do that if I needed to. After you discussed it with him, or I, I just tell him later, I'm going. Well, just like Milwaukee, I yeah. came home and he said, "Did you take the job?" And I said, "Yeah." Like, you know. A lot of husbands would have not been happy. Huh? But they would not have been happy. And they they would have. He said, okay. You know, I mean, he, he was so laid back, and that was fine. I could go to Milwaukee. And I didn't. And, and well, but see, he had jobs where he traveled a lot. <laughs> when he was doing the TV stations, he was out on the road half the time. And. Uh, but equal partners, it sounds like. But we just had the kind of relationship where you know you did what you had to do, and it and and it and it worked for us. So, but that that was a big part because if if it hadn't if I had not have had that flexibility, I probably couldn't have done half of what I did. <laughs> You know, because if I hadn't gone to Milwaukee, I'd have never been an EMCS engineer. But, uh, but anyway, but so, but EMCS, that was, you know, that all had to do with tweaking your energy balance and keeping everything, you know, you use the heat from the, from the, the exhaust of this to heat the water for this. And, oh, it was exciting. Well, that sort of knowledge, had you learned some of it at OAMC? Oklahoma A&M no, when you no, were this was picked up this along was, the way. Well, because they weren't even thinking about EMCS. Uh, that's true. And, the, and that kind of thing when I went to OAMC. But you need you need to... But I, I, I was fortunate in always having the opportunity to learn about technology as it evolved. 
Right place, right time. Yep. Just like telephones. You know, back the the second, even the second time we moved to California, we didn't have a telephone for weeks because there wasn't a, a line available. Now you don't have to have a wire. Before they, people thought you had to have a wire. You yep. know, <laughs> it's it's it's. Uh, but you know, Frank, Frank got disenchanted with TV when they went to digital. He, he, was, like, he was like Edison thinking D, uh, AC wouldn't work over DC. Frank didn't think digital would work over, over analog. He'd be surprised. Well, he was. Well, he saw. He, 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 was, he, lived, he lived to see flat screen TVs and stuff <laughs> like that. So that big, big long tube you had to have. I can remember our first TV, you had a cabinet about this square and a picture about that big <laughs> on the end of the tube. But uh, anyway, so, uh, so I went to Wilford Hall and uh, well, I went to Milwaukee and I got this training. And I came back and I was the EMCIS engineer at Wilford Hall, which was very exciting. You had a general in charge. Had supervision, you had to supervise? Oh yeah, I had, well let's see, I had the EMCIS shop and then I had the refrigeration shop and I had, well they had somebody else over the heating shop. And then I was basically, in charge of the total energy plant operation, although the contractor ran it for the first two years. But uh, yeah, I was basically in charge of making sure that hospital stayed on. <laughs> Do you think people were surprised that it was a woman doing that? Uh, well, we had got, I think to some degree, yes, but uh, by that time we were far enough into Women's lib. Women's lib. Well, just like, I remember one time I went TDY with a group of, of uh, four or five men. And they put us in the place where we rented to stay. We had a suite. So we had this big central room and four or five bedrooms around it. And I was the only woman. And they only had one bathroom, you know, you had to share the bathroom. Well, you know, nobody seemed to care. Got to go to the bathroom in the night and you pass one of your friends coming out, talk to them, say hi, just like you would at work and go back to your... It was... Because most men, most, well, at least most, in, most engine, men who are engineers are, they're not the kind that, that all they think about is sex, you know. They, you're there to do a job, you're getting the job done, and that's the important thing. You know, we, you know how when, when, the, when something good happens and everybody's hugging and patting each other on the rear, I got my pats on the rear, but it, it, it wasn't sexual, it was, it was, I was included, you know. Nah, I never felt like, I never, I never felt threatened in my life. I was all the, and now you, we got women that go up and live in the space station, you know? Yes. Well, you would have been in the business, like what I was reading, 1969 was when the Apollo 11 yeah. landed on the moon. Yeah. I mean, you were in the, in the in the biz, as they say, we yeah, were about that time too. So yeah, that was about. That's when we were we were still living in Virginia. That's but uh, but anyway, when I got to work for the government, well, and much of much of the good that happened to me was because the government was reorganizing, and they decided about the same after this experience with Wilfred Hall. And that was a real coup because that was a thousand bed hospital and it was most, probably the most state of the art hospital in the United States when it was first built because it had all, the, and we were doing all this, 
energy recovery and everything, you know, that we were right on the cutting edge of that. Yeah. And it was exciting. And uh, so then I... Uh, was it an eight hour a day? Was it an eight hour a day job, 40 hour a week job? Well, that's what it was toted as, but, but you know, it was one of those things, if something, as long as everything went smooth, the answer is yes. Okay. If something happened, you had to be there. Okay. Yeah. But I, when I remember, and, well, I remember one time, this was well, one, once a year they had to test all the relays in the power plant, and they always did it from midnight to eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, because that was the slow, the slowest time, and you could be on your emergency power and everything. And my boss, Ed Brewer, he calls me, and we we go down to the hospital to do the to watch the. We didn't do the test; we watched the test being done. And. Uh, so we finished up, we, we, we finished up about four or five o'clock in the morning and we stopped at Assembles for breakfast. And Ed just Ed's pager goes off, you know, we all had to carry pagers. Ed's pager goes off. Ed says, we gotta go back to the hospital. I says, why? Because we gotta get ready for the Shah of Iran. And I says, anyway, so they had, you remember when the, when the Shah of Iran had to come to this country? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and first he was in New York and then they brought him to Wilford Hall. And this was in the, uh, you know, we dark hours of the morning. And so we, we were trying to figure out where we we're going to put him. And the only doors, the only ward that had locks was the psycho ward. So we had to clear out. The, some of the psycho ward moved this furniture from the general's office so he'd have a sitting room. And we were doing all this, dashing around. And I remember, I remember Frank, Frank had, I, I, I had left my pager on my purse in the EMCS room. And the pager goes off about eight o'clock and Ed answers it and it's Frank and Frank says, Frank says, I, I just, I was expecting Ruth home by now. Now where where are you? And Ed says, "Oh, we're getting we're getting ready for the shop." And Frank says, uh, "Ed got the biggest kick out of this because Frank says it is, he was half asleep." He says, "Ed, I'm having trouble separating fact from fiction this morning." But it really was. They brought the shop in with about eight or ten civil uh, FBI, CIA people, FBI people, somebody on each side of him, and he actually walked in. But my job, but I had to be standing down by this back of elevators, not letting anybody use them. So when all these people came in, the elevators were staying there open, ready for them to get on. Anyway, but that was, <laughs> that was an exciting time. So then, after all this, after Wilford Hall, let me check here a minute. After Wilford Hall, we did, oh, I went to, uh, I went to AETC at Randolph. AETC stands for Air Education and Training Command. You know, they have like SAC and TAC in AETC. Anyway, so, the headquarters for AETC is at Randolph. And I, I'm, I got a call asking me to interview for a job at AETC, which I did. And uh, so they, then I, they, they sought you out again. Yeah. Hmm. It was, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't one of those things where I had to go out eagerly searching. I'd have people call me, just like Ed Brewer. I didn't know Ed Brewer from Adam. Hmm. And Reputation he, preceded you, but but I had I had the I had the mechanical engineering and I had the electrical engineering and I had the the PE license, the credentials. Yes. I had the credentials, and I think I do think there's a register, and I think they go. But anyway, so. Uh, 
Or was it? So anyway, I interviewed for this job at headquarters AETC, and I got it. In the, as a mechanical, as a, and by, I was, the opening was a mechanical engineer, not an electrical engineer. But because I had taken this training and my PE license said I could be any kind, there I was. But, you know, it, it wasn't without effort because I had to take classes, you know, to, 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 to get these. I, 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 you know, I had to take the PE license three, test three times, but I was determined I was going to do this, you know. You have, you have to work at it a little you bit. You have to work at it a little bit. And, uh, but anyway, so then I, I get the job at AETC. And I'm working in, as a mechanical engineer instead of electrical, but that's okay, you know. And then I get to be the head of the mechanical design branch, because the guy had, uh, retires. And I, you know, I said, I applied for it and got it. And then, they had all of a sudden, the government decides they had too many Air Force bases and they start closing bases, and they were closing bases and moving missions. And so who starts getting all the jobs that have to do with that is me, my, my branch. And I didn't have, I had four or five people working for me, but you know, I didn't have a lot a mob. So one day I found out from SAC, Strategic Air Command, I found out from somebody there that they actually had a separate branch that managed BRAC, you know, the base realignment and closure. So I come back and I tell my boss, I said, you know, the Pentagon's funding these BRAC branches. And he says, if I get one, will you take it? And I says, yes, sir, you know, I will. And he says, okay. So he got a BRAC branch and I, then I became the head of the, I didn't have to interview. I, I got, I got, I became the head of the BRAC branch, and, uh, which was a very interesting, this is, this is a good way to close out my career, because we had all these, you know, in order to do a construction job in the Air Force, you have to work through the Army Corps of Engineers, mm. or the Navy, and it, down in the south it's the Navy, but. Most of the places, it's the Army Corps of Engineers. And they're the ones who hire the architect and the contractor and everything. So anyway, we have this, we have this uh, uh, navigator school out at Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento. And they want to move it to Beale Air Force Base in North Cal Northern California, which is a SAC base. So you have to you have to work with all these various unrelated people that get thrown together, you know. So I uh, so we were working on this, and and you have to meet with the users, you know, and make sure they have all their requirements met, and, and we go through all these design reviews and everything. We're not actually doing the design, and they for the. The Corps of Engineers selects is doing the design, but we have to give all the requirements and we have to do all the design reviews. So, uh, we get, then all of a sudden, about the time, and when they, when they close a base, you know, it's going to close by a certain date, and you got so much money to do it with. So then, about, just weeks before we were ready to award a contract at Beale, the base, the Bragg branch in the Pentagon decides they want to move it to Randolph here in San Antonio. Hmm. Well, you know, that's okay, but we've got to, but they don't give you any more time to close Mather and they don't give you any more money. Well, the Corps of Engineers always had this tradition that they didn't, swap jobs back and forth between Brett core divisions. And we had this project all done. And it would have and it would the buildings matched 
close enough match to building at Randolph, you know, we could build it there. All we had to do was revise the site plan and revise it a little bit. Oh, we can't, we'd never done that. You know, it was, it, it just, we don't, we don't do that. So finally I get up in front of this meeting of everybody and I say, guys, we can either look really good or we can look really bad, depends on how we play this game. But we got this project all designed and we don't have any more design money to start over and we can, ha we can get the firm in San Francisco to side, it, side adapt it to Randa and we can award odd time and we can be odd budget. And finally the light comes on, <laughs> you know. I won, you know. I just got up and I said, you know. If we don't, we've got a mess on our hands. Mm -hmm. And the navigator school won't have anywhere to go. So they find, they saw the logic in it and so they let it, so we did it. And we have a beautiful little, it's not a navigator school anymore. They moved the navigator school to Pensacola and now it's the audit agency or something else. But we've got these beautiful buildings at Randolph. Thanks to Ruth. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> And then we had this other thing where we had a tra had training for uh, that's now out at Camp Bullis, Air Base Ground Defense, that the Army had been doing for the Air Force. And finally, all of a sudden, about the time we were supposed to be awarding a contract, the Army wasn't going to do that anymore for the Air Force. So we had to scrounge around and we had X amount of of money to spend an X amount of time, and if you didn't get it awarded the, the first go around, the, the time was out and the money expired. And, and so I did the same thing. I just said, you know, we can either do a lot of additive bid items so that we can, we have some flexibility with what we award. In the court, well, we don't like, contractors don't like additive bid items. And I said, well, but this, you know, okay, you can, we can make it work or we don't. And uh, that one worked too. In fact, that's one of my medals up there from the Army is because, because of that Air Base Ground Defense thing. But, but you know, it's, it all has to do with not worrying about what you, what you, this is what we always do, but you look for a way to make happen what you need to happen. You adapt. And, and you adapt, right. You adapt and you <laughs> adapt. That's one of my favorite words. You don't always accept, you adapt. Right? You adapt, yes. right. <laughs> so at what point did you get your promotion to, to a GS? Oh, well, okay. 14. Uh, back when they were going to close Kelly, you know, Kelly closed. And, but part of Kelly that had the reserve installation on it and the runways and everything went to Lackland because they had a common boundary. And there was a gentleman who had been the chief of engineering at Kelly for quite a number of years who was just supposed to stay with Kelly closed. And about to between two and three years before it was supposed to close, his wife got terminal cancer and he had to quit. So they just came to me and asked me if I'd take it. There was no, I didn't have to apply or anything. They just said, Ruth, uh, you're, you, you've got the quals and part of the thing because I had a PE license. Because that was one, and that was when this guy, Bernie Hare, who had hired me at Fort Sam that first time, mm -hmm. Then he was then working for me because he never he didn't have a PE license, so he couldn't even apply. He wasn't even eligible. <laughs> so he was working for me. So your title became chief engineer. Yeah, I was. Yeah. So that was. But well, see, that line of people in there in the when you go in the in there where all the medals are, there's a picture. Mm -hmm. That was shop. that was. A lot of those people that were in that picture worked for me. But anyway, when, when all the space closure stuff was going on, you know, and we were actually getting projects awarded on time and in budget, 
Two of my, two of my, two of the colonels I worked, I worked for, got their stars. They made Brigadier General, and they, they, they both actually told me I helped them get it. Yeah. So anyway, that's the, that's the story of my life. <laughs> So then you got you ended up with you said with a GS fourteen. GS fourteen, yeah. And then you retired in what year? Oh, twenty twenty. My my retirement's in there twenty ten, I think. Your first time. Well, no, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. I got it on there. Just a minute. You you had said you retired in twenty oh one. I think it was twenty oh one. Twenty oh one. Okay. You would have been if you were born in twenty four. What? How old were you when you retired? We can we can. Well, let me let me let me let me let me think. Let me think a minute. I retired. Well, I I, I actually retired. Go in there and look on that. I've mean, got my <laughs> retirement certificate in. I think it was. I think it was twenty o twenty o one. I think. Huh? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, but then I know. I, so I retired, and within a couple of day, within days after I announced my retirement, Lackland Air Force Base was beating on my door, wanting me to come back as a contractor. So I worked. At, I came back as a contractor to Lackland for five years, and then I came back as a contractor to AETC for five. years. Working for MWH, that mug, uh, for five years, and then I retired. And you were how old by that time? Let's see, 2001 and 10 years is 2011, so and I was born in 1924. 86? I was in my 80s. 86, 87, something like that. Yeah, you were well past 65. Well past. Well, see, my husband retired at 60, but like a normal person. But you know, he didn't, he didn't complain because I wasn't there for him. He didn't complain. He was the neatest guy. Did he cook? <laughs> yeah. Did, did he have it, wasn't, it wasn't a matter of, what are we having for dinner tonight? It's where do you want to go eat? <laughs> okay. We ate out most of the time. Well, I mean, that's part of this. How do you solve those type of issues, too, with both working? So Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, Well, we both enjoyed eating out. And by that time, we didn't have any kids at home. You know, we could do what we wanted to do. Right. What do you think the turning point was in your career, or do you think there was one? Uh, well, I think my, the major... I think a big turning point was when I went to work for civil service instead of working for private company. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different world. It opened up many, many you know, possibilities that I would never, when you're with a small private company, you know, that you're... You're limited. So. You're limited when you work for civil service. The world is your oyster, oh. <laughs> Well, did you supervise mostly men? Oh yeah, I mean mostly. there weren't, weren't too many, many too many women under you. There were some, but some. not too many. Mostly men. But one of the things I did when I went to Kelly, and I got a very nice that that one of those medals is what I got when I left Kelly. Was. Uh, you know, you have, I had both military and civilian working for me. I had young lieutenants. And these young lieutenants were fresh out of school and they had to learn how to do, you know, they had their latest. And I turned them loose and let them, let them do what, let them do what they learned how to do. Right. Which many, it, it's interesting how many bosses, how many people there are in the world who don't, who are afraid to step over the edge and do something that nobody's ever done before. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, I, there was this one night guy I really liked who worked for the 
Fort Worth District Court. And he was always saying, we don't do it that way. And I said, well, Lewis, maybe you need to change. <laughs> because I was always open to to uh, state of the art, you know. And this is, if you need, if you need, if this is available, let's try it. Mm -hmm. Even in even when I did design, you know, and I'd come to some new innovation in HVAC control, let's try it, you know. Where do you do you think that started back with your parents or grandparents letting you try things? I think partly. Partly. And I think my my mother my mother was. Well, like I said, she taught herself to drive her father's car around the barnyard. I told you that. Uh -uh. Oh, well, yeah, my mother's father got her first car in, in O'Brien County, Iowa. And when he was out in the field and couldn't hear her, she, she practiced driving. She would watch how he started it, and she'd practice driving around. And one day he came in and had hurt his hand out in the field on some equipment. Needed to go to the doctor, and he said, I don't think I can drive. My mother said, I'll drive you. He said, you don't know how, and she said, yes, I do, get in, I'll show you. And so <laughs> after that, she got the car every time she wanted it. But it was, you know, all of these people who are, we're just like not, not needing a wire for a telephone anymore. You know, that was a major change in civilization. And, and uh, you have to accept, you, you just, you look, you look at what's ahead and not what's behind. You don't fear jumping, stepping off the edge of the cliff and seeing what happens. <laughs> well, did either one of your daughters go into engineering? My son, my son is in uh, alternative energy. He has a degree in alternative energy. But just from St. Phillips, he, he didn't, he was in the Navy for a while. He is interested in, right now he's working on a project on repurposing batteries. You know, they have these lithium ion batteries for the electric cars. Mm -hmm. Well, you also need batteries for storage for solar panels. And apparently, it, when the lithium ion batteries get past the point where they're usable in cars, you can repurpose them and use them for, and since he was already had worked in solar, with solar panels, he, he, that's what he's interested in right now, repurposing batteries. Well, he saw you do tinkering and that sort of thing too. <laughs> but see, and I was, I was never a tinkerer at home. Oh, okay. I didn't have hobbies building radios. Now my husband did. When he was in high school, is that thing still on? When he was in high school, he uh, he built his own uh, uh, receiver and got his own and got his amateur radio license. And he was always building something. In fact, when when uh, I got my inheritance from my folks, one of the things we did was build him a 20 by 20 air conditioned workshop out in the backyard because by then he'd retired. And we, and we went around to antique stores and collected radios from the 20s and 30s and he'd restore them and get them working. Oh. So when he passed away, we actually, he had wanted to have a museum and that never materialized. But uh, we had, we grossed over $20,000 on these Radios he bought, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars at antique stores and restored. He had some neat ones, some of the early ones. But one day, now a lot of my friends, my husband had done that out of Kelly. We had, you know, we lived in Converse and we had a nice maple dining room set with extensions. And he had his workshop and he had workbenches in the garage and he had workbenches in his workshop. And one day I come home and here he is soldering on the dining table. When he, he, he wasn't, you know, he had cardboard down. It wasn't like he was ruining the finish or anything, but he was soldering there in the dining room. And I said, uh, I said, how, 
How come your salary got to that at table when you have all those workbenches? All my workbenches were full. <laughs> that was my husband. <laughs> but you see, I didn't, that, I understood. Yeah. You know, because he didn't give me a hard time about my traveling and all this, and I didn't give him a hard time about doing what. Well, did you talk shop around the dinner table? Electric, you know, both since we both are electricians, did you? Sometimes. Electrical. Well, no, you know, if, if I was having something, I'd tell him a, about my job, and if he was, and he'd, if he would, if he'd gotten some little radio to work, he'd always show it to me, you know, and yeah, and look, listen to it. And Help each other problem solve some? Or not really? Sometimes, not very often. Not really. I, to me, it's just from listening to you, it sounds like your approach and your attitude helped move you along along your career. Oh, well, it, it, okay, the, first adapt. That, that's a very important word. You adapt to your situation. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't try to, to, to uh, well, no, you, you do try to change it if you need to. But you figure out a way to adapt your problem to some to a solution. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not be one anybody's ever tried before, but you got to come up with a solution that works. And you got to worry about time, and you got to worry about money, and you got to worry. But on this all the space closure stuff, the main thing was time, and and the Brack Commission, which worked out of the Pentagon, was infamous for wanting, for having something all ready to award, and then, oh, well, we decided we'd put it over here. Well, you know what, you gotta figure out a way. So, so what would what would be the tool of the trade for you? What would you, like, paper or pencil, or your calculator, or what? Or none of those? None of those? <laughs> Just what was in your well, head, huh? <laughs> um, back in my early days, I was very good at, at doing ink on my art drawings. Okay. And when I worked for AE firms and we had to do our drawings, you know, the mechanical systems and the electrical systems, I uh, I was good at that. And then, like I said, worked on doing the location maps for the highway department when we lived to Tucson, too. I really, I, I really enjoyed that. I found it. Uh, I guess we should ask which was your favorite job through the years. My favorite job through the years, probably Wilford Hall. It was probably the most. Well, because we were pushing, we were pushing the, en the envelope of technology, and it was uh, exciting and all the. It, it, it was, a lot of people would have said, would have been so stressed out, but for some reason, I, I don't, I don't stress particularly. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got, I've got, my wheels are turning saying, how are we going to get out of this mess, but. You work the problem, and working the problem. But, but I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy be coming up with a solution. You know, and I had to do some pretty tall talking to get people to pay attention to some of my solutions. You know, like moving that navigator school to Randolph. Oh, and then the, it's funny because we had a commanding general at Randolph at the time who didn't, who hated having colored buildings on an Air Force base. He wanted everything tan and brown. And the buildings that we had designed for Beale had they were they were brown brick, but they had blue tiles accents up in the corners. And I remember we had to brief General Ashy about the about the uh, project and moving it. And I said, "Sir, you'll notice the renderings show the blue tile, but." Uh, we can change that to any, t or any earth tone you choose.
And he doesn't, he sits there and doesn't say anything and doesn't say anything. You know, I kind of like him blue. Everybody almost fell out of their chair. <laughs> so. What impact, if any, do you think being a female had on your career? You know, I don't know whether... After I got to a certain point, I didn't think of it as being... Uh, as a gender thing. I just thought of it as as we work together and we come up with solutions. And, and ability. And ability, your ability to get things done. Well, I... Uh, I, I was very blessed. Well, when you, you said you had to sell people on your idea. Were, were they reluctant because you were a female presenting it or just because it was... Not I think I always took it that it was more. We just have never, we have not we don't do it that way. Yeah. Okay. I think I don't think it. I don't think my being a female really, because I had, you know, I worked with the Sacramento Sheriff District and the Tulsa District and the Fort Worth District and the Dallas Division. I worked with all these people, and I don't think. I honestly never felt like it was, like there was any, by the time I got up that far, mm -hmm. I don't think, I, I never felt that there was any discrimination because I was a female. I just mm -hmm. really didn't. And like I said, that one guy told me he'd forgotten I was. Now, a lot of women would have been offended. Yeah. But, Okay, so I I I I adapted. <laughs> but no, I just I just I loved I loved every minute of it. You must Most every minute of it. Well, to do it till you're 86. You had to like some of it. Well, it was. I found it exciting. Did you ever have to? Well, no. And once you got in the government, you didn't have to campaign for a pay raise. That was just part of Oh that, that, that was, was just um, part of it. Well, yeah. No, that was but except on this 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 when I got to be when I got this position as head of the BRAC branch, that was a GM. And there and you know on the GS you have you can only get a raise every so you know, it's on the schedule. On the GM you can get a raise every year. So I took advantage of that. I got one every year. Through through the years, have you mentored any other young women, young women along the way to encourage them? Uh, I have uh, particularly uh, young Air Force people. Yeah, when I worked, I uh, I was uh, there. Were, there was a couple of young ladies I remember that I. I uh, meant, I, I think I, I think they considered me their mentor. We were military, you know. And, but but the times changed so much. You know that that's what that's what is so exciting about the whole thing is that the whole the whole world view of things is different. You know, like when my when my mother was raised when I was a little kid, my mother was coming along. Uh, she, you did what you did. You cooked and you baked and you baked and you washed and you ironed and you and uh, and you didn't you you didn't even think of. Now my mother had a nursing degree. She never went out and was a nurse after she married. Hmm. She'd help her friends if they be help with the birthing of a baby or something if they were having it at home, but she never actually nursed. So and maybe maybe the war with the men going off to war during your college days. And I think was, it was, I a key, think, was a key factor. I think too. that was a key. It was a big factor. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, this article in the 
talks about the fact that that the war opened up avenues for women that had never yeah. been before. But this, but the nowadays it seems to me maybe I'm wrong, but most of the people I know who are couples both work. You know, it's that's what you expect. Yeah. And weird. back then it was almost taboo for oh, poor thing, she had to go to work. <laughs> you know, it, it's... Well, and you mentioned at lunch your mother shared a story with you about voting for the first time. Oh, yeah. In the 1920s. You weren't, you weren't born until 24, so... I was born in 24, and I was... Well, uh, and my, they were married in 23, so this was... This was when women's suffrage came in, which was 1930, give or take when women could vote. Yeah. So she was a good role model for you too. Well, yeah, cuz she was kind of yeah. Well, did you did you as a kid did you play with what was boy toys at that time, you know, trains versus dolls or did you Well, I I had both. Had both. But when I was I remember my, on my the Christmas when I was five, 6 I wanted an electric train. My grand, my German grandpa got me an electric train. And when I was about four or five, I wanted a little, I got, and my son said he'd get it out, and I told him not bother. I had this little metal steam shovel, you know, that you could, you had to work it manually with the crank, but you could make it dig. And, but it, but I also had dolls. In fact, in that cabinet there, I had a doll. My German grandfather made me this beautiful doll furniture. And uh, he was a basket maker by trade, and he made me this beautiful doll furniture. So, your grandfather on your mom's side? My German your, grandfather, on, yeah. On your mom's, on my mom's side. On your mother's side. But now, can, are, are we... We're, we're all, if you're done, if you if you think you're at the end of what you're telling, I have one last question. Okay, one last question. Yeah, I always end up with, you know, when history is written about Ruth, what do you want people to remember about you? What do you want it to say about you? Uh, she adapted. <laughs> Other than Tom that. Cole, Tom Cole remembers that I talk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love to talk. I mean, how do you want people to remember you? Um, well, it depends on who I'm talking about. Because now I have all these women who are good friends of mine here. We don't ever talk about engineering or anything. You know, I want, I want them to remember me as a friend. Okay. I want to be. I want. To, I want everybody to feel like I'm their friend. Okay. And for your grand good you. <laughs> uh, you're there. We're good. How about your grandchildren? How do they? How do you want them to remember? Well, you know, my I, I see my grandchildren so seldom because they, we we've never lived close, or not my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. I see so seldom. My grandchildren act like they adore me. I guess they do. <laughs> No, I, I'm I'm just a real friendly, laid back person, and that's the way I want people to read to think of me. Okay. Well, you you've been great. Your story's been great. I appreciate you sharing it with me.